Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. The intrepid, the fearless, the bold Patrick Lancaster joins us now, not from the wilds uh, uh, of the battlefront, but from the comfort of his hotel room in Moscow, where Patrick and I had planned to uh, meet up and spend a little time together and do a broadcast together, but uh, events uh, canceled my trip. But Patrick, welcome here. Before we start with all the dynamic tape you have given us, including you being right there under live fire, how are you and why are you in Me in Moscow? Uh, hi, Judge. Um, it, as normal, it's uh, great uh, to be on with you again. Thanks, uh, as always, to uh, to you and your team for bringing me on and helping me uh, spread my uh, reports and messages to the world because it's, it's hard to get everything out across the world. And I'm glad we have uh, people that are, you know, not trying to hide certain things like a lot of the media and we can actually get the uh, information out on both sides. All right. You, um, you have given us some dramatic video. Let's go right to it. The first of these shows you present, uh, at the explosion of a Russian mortar after the Russians received, I think incoming fire from a drone. Do I have that right? Um, well, basically the situation here on this, uh, this latest report of mine is I traveled, uh, uh, to Russian forces at a military, uh, position on the last, basically the last front line of the Lugansk area or the Lugansk people's Republic area, depending on what side of this conflict you favor is what you call these areas. But the fact is this area is the Lugansk region that the Ukrainians and West calls the Lugansk uh, 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 part of Ukraine and Russian law calls the Lugansk or Lugansk People's Republic region of Russia. So where you sit is depending on how you call it. The local people that live there call it the Lugansk People's Republic as part of Russia. Uh, but this front line is the Belogorovka front line, which is the last front stronghold of Ukrainian forces in this Lugansk area, basically uh, the last of few areas that are still controlled by Ukrainian forces. And this area, Matt, is the battle, basically, of Russia trying to force Ukrainian forces, the last Ukrainian forces, out of the Lugansk area, Lugansk People's Republic area. And I'm documenting them attacking Ukrainian forces with 122 millimeter mortar shells. And that's what we're going to see here, I believe. Okay. So in a moment, we're going to see a, a Ukrainian drone uh, attacking Russian troops in what Ukraine says is Ukraine and Russia says is Russia. And you're right there. And then we're going to see a Russian mortar um, propelled in the direction of the Ukrainian troops. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. While we were there on the position, going through the process of Russia uh, attacking the uh, position, the Ukrainian positions with mortars, the Russians were um, uh, identified by Ukrainian reconnaissance and a what I was told was a Ukrainian kamikaze drone came in at the positions now it didn't hit us but i could hear it okay. uh so it was a little bit scary <laughs> all right i can see uh and the and the audience will see in a minute you were uh not comfortable there you are dressed in full uh military protective gear so chris cut number one the drone strike Well, this is the situation here. Drones overhead and outgoing artillery, mortars. For his, for the situation this is, it's almost surreal. 
almost surreal, my dear friend. You're so courageous. Is that the closest you have come to live fire? Uh, no, no. I've been actually shot at many times um, and have had uh, shells explode um, about 10 meters, a little over 10 yards from me in the past. Um, there's bullets, rockets, and things like that whiz by my head. So All right. Be before I've, we I've get... had quite the I've had quite the, uh, the experience with being fired at over the years, but uh, and uh, yeah, so it is before, what it is. Before we get to the clip where you are running with troops through the field, uh, and before we show uh, Russian artillery being prepared. Uh, for uh, for use, uh, let me ask you some big picture uh, questions. Uh, do the Ukrainians stand a chance in stopping the Russian onslaught? Uh, the Russians say they don't. Um, the Russian morale uh, is pretty <laughs> up right now because of the constant advances of Russian forces, um, which is, you know, a, a fact. I believe a few days ago, less than a week a week ago, um, the Russian Defense Ministry has claimed that uh, uh, in the last uh, um, time there has been 180 new square kilometers uh, taken control of by Russian forces from Ukrainian control. Um so, you know, as I've been saying, since Avdivka uh, was taken control of by U uh, Russia, there's it's a new war now. Uh, Russia has bumped it up to the uh, storm or assault mode and is just taking territory one step at a time. Now, some channels out there, some reporters will say, oh, well, they're taking fields uh, and all this non-strategical stuff. Well, the the fact is that, yeah, they're taking fields, but they're also taking settlements, towns, and villages. Um, so anybody that tries to get you to believe that these are that 180 square kilometers taken control of by Russia from Ukraine isn't a strategical gain, they're lying to you. And I think the the, the viewers out there can understand that themselves. That the the when. The media is trying to say these gains are not important, uh, but minor villages being held by Ukraine are. Um, I think, you know, the people out there can think that it for themselves. As I say in all my videos, get as much information as possible and try to understand when somebody's trying to pull the rug, rug over your face. Okay, let's go um, to the next clip. This will show you and we will hear you narrating as you're running uh, through a field uh with russian troops it's a drone solution huh? yeah. Да, да, ну подлетает, подлетает, слышу его. Заходи, заходи. Ну давай, ага. короче, как будешь стоять, то не Да, да, принял, принял. Alright, so, I uh, heard from the... Командир, ну дайте сразу мне сейчас корректуру, я посчитаю сразу возьму. Я сразу секунду нашу. Alright, so orders are coming from the leadership. Uh, so, we get word from the, the commander here on the ground of this position uh, uh, that uh, that was a Ukrainian kamikaze drone that we were hearing just overhead, and it seems like they might have hit the uh, the neighboring position or something along those lines is what I understand. Um, but we're gonna stay here in this bunker underground for a few minutes, and then. As I assume, the soldiers are going to move out and continue to engage uh, Ukrainian forces. Were you afraid for your life when you made that clip? 
Um, well, yeah, at the beginning, for sure. Once it got down in the hole in the bunker, it felt quite a bit better. It's amazing how such old technology works so well on the battlefield. Uh, but yeah, once I just before that um, uh, clip started is when I heard the drone. And as soon as I heard it, they heard it as well. It just started saying run and I clicked the camera on. And before we had gone to the pit, before we, they had started firing, they had showed me the hole, the uh, bunker where in the events of a drone, they said, you dive in this hole. And that's exactly what we did. Everything worked exactly as is, they said. Um, and luckily, uh, I was not hit by the kamikaze drone. Um, so now why, kind of why do you call it? I know what the word means, at least in American culture. But why do you call it a kamikaze drone? Aren't all these drones kamikaze drones? There are some of them surveillance drones that are just taking pictures and then leaving. Okay. Well, basically well, what we've got is you know, on both sides, uh, Russian and Ukrainian, three types of drones uh, or three, you know, ge general types of drones. Of course, there's, you know, a thousand different brands and variants, uh, but the major three types is one, uh, as you said, reconnaissance, which is used to find new locations, to target artillery. I mean, specifically, like during this mortar attack, the people on the radio that they're talking to is someone at a different position who's got a drone in the sky watching in real time the location that those mortar uh, shells are landing on Ukrainian positions and telling them how to correct uh, their fire. Uh, and that's a common use of re reconnaissance drones. Another type is the kamikazes, our FPV drones, as I said. And those are little hobby drones that cost about $500 to make that uh, they use to fly into people, equipment. And I mean, they can use 500, a $500 drone to take out a $2 million tank. And it works extremely well on both sides. And uh, then we've also got the drones that are mainly like DJI uh, drones where they have special attachments that they attach a grenade or a mortar shell or some sort of ammunition. And they have an extra button on the remote uh, control where they go over a Ukrainian position or um, tank or something like this, push the button and whatever ammunition they have on their drone gets dropped directly on top of whatever they're trying to eliminate. And both sides use those uh, tactics. And this is really, as far as I understand, the first war that has really used full-on drone warfare in this in, to this high of a level, where drones are a huge factor in this war on both sides. And that's why I try to report so much on them. Since uh, we last spoke, um, <clears throat> the president of France uh, announced that whatever equipment the French have given to the Ukrainians, they can use to strike inside of Russia. The prime minister of uh, Great Britain, the chancellor of Germany, and mo most importantly, the secretary of state of the United States. Has this in any way of, of affected, any way you can perceive uh, the morale or the attitude of the Russians or the morale or the attitude of the Ukrainians, that Western offensive weaponry in the hands of the Ukrainians, but operated by Western um, out-of-uniform troops, can target inside Russia. It's just infuriated uh, both the military, the government, and the people. I mean, because especially the people that live in the Belgorod uh, region of Russia have been under, are under daily attack in Russia, not a disputed area. But let's say the Russian uh, city of Belgorod, which I did a report, a full film on not long ago. I mean, this uh, city has thousands of civilian residents, thousands, not uh, not hardly any like uh, some sources might try to lie to you and try uh, to pull the rug again over your eyes. These cities, particularly the Belgrade, I've seen the hundreds of thousands of civilians living there, children, women, and the West is trying to say that it's okay 
for Ukraine to attack these Russian cities with uh, uh, Western supplied weapons. It's not okay to attack these civilians. As I showed in my report, these rockets coming from the border of the Kharkov region of Ukraine into Russia and just landing randomly across the city. It's not okay at all. And that's what is being done with Western people's tax money. The we weapons that are being supplied to the West uh, to uh, Ukraine by the West. And it's not okay. And something needs to be done to get people to stop dying on both sides. Have you um, come across any Americans operating Ukrainian equipment, soldiers out of uniform, intelligence uh, officers, obviously they don't wear uniforms, or outside contractors, as far as you know. I ask this because we are told that some of the American weaponry is so sophisticated that it requires a person with a top secret uh, security clearance, an American top secret security clearance, to download data from uh, a satellite. Have you come across any American who, in your view, was doing that? Um, obviously, I, I don't report much on if, in the, uh, the Ukrainian positions, but as far as information that I've been told by refugees and uh, other locals, uh, civilian locals, yeah, there are foreigners, uh, mercenaries that are working with Ukrainian forces, as we all know, specifically about operating th this uh, equipment. I can't really uh, comment. Of course, there's... Um, I've heard through the grapevine there has been uh, uh, Americans captured, but me as a journalist trying to stick to all the uh, the areas of the Geneva Convention, not going into gray areas, I make it a point to kind of steer clear of uh, any um, prisoners of war, uh, just to keep the you know keep all on the the right path of journalism. Just as I said, no gray areas to show the people and continue to show the people what I see with my own eyes and not run the risk of uh, doing anything that might hurt someone, uh, particularly on either side. And that goes for uh, POWs as well. Got so it. unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience with working for the for working with the foreigners um, that have been captured by Russia. But I think now we can move on to this. Uh, this All right. So uh, tell us, tell us what we're looking at here. This is film uh, with which you provided us, Patrick. All right. Now this is the position commander that the the high ranking uh, person on the positions where they were attacking the uh, Ukrainian positions from, and that's what he was showing us was their cache of 120 uh, 20 millimeter mortar, Soviet made, Russian made mortar shells, and that's exactly what we were seeing being shot out of that tube to Ukrainians and what they're trying to that particular position, their jobs to fire those when called upon, when they have the targeting information to kill uh, Ukrainian soldiers and destroy whatever equipment they might be using. So obviously the Russians do not have a problem with an American journalist photographing their equipment and showing it as you have just done with us. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, doing my best to uh, show the West what's really happening. And I mean, you're not going to see the the other Western journalists come here. And I think it's understood that I, you know, really show the truth of what I see. I don't try to spin it in some way that fits the Western narrative uh, or, or try to make hit pieces or something like this, which is, as you know, pretty much the standard uh, for the Western media now, unfortunately. Um, you know, I am totally independent. I just put what I see on my own YouTube channel without having to submit it to anyone or give any uh, uh, type of uh, uh, edits because of what narrative it might uh, fill, uh, show. I just show the facts that I see and try to show the world the other side of what they're their eyes are trying to be closed to. Patrick, you're a uh, you're a brave man, courageous man, and a patriot. And I thank you for all the time uh, you've given us and all the knowledge and the tape that you've shared with us.
I know you're in Moscow and you're traveling. When you're back and you're ready to come on the show, you just you know how to reach us. We'll put you right back on. I appreciate right, you personally as a colleague and as a courageous friend. And I know the audience appreciates you. I can tell from what they're saying about you in the chat room. And I can tell from the numbers that are watching you now and will watch you once this is posted and streaming, which it will uh, be in just a moment. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Judge. I really appreciate it always being on. And for uh, your viewers, if you want to see the extended uh, versions of my that report and other reports, my YouTube channel, Patrick Lancaster, um, can be seen in the comments below, I believe. And also, uh, you know, I'm able to do this independent work because of only being funded by my viewers. So if you want to help support my uh, work, you can also see the link in the comments. I'm only commented by my er, uh, support. Uh, supported by my viewers so you can uh, support my work with the link in the uh, comments below, I believe. Thank you, Patrick. God bless you. All the best. We'll see you again soon. Thank you very much, Judge. Sure. So our schedule for today has changed since it was uh, originally posted. Uh, Phil Giraldi uh, will be on with us next week. He was originally scheduled for three o'clock today. Instead, we have Kyle Anzalone from antiwar.com. Uh, a young man with a vast knowledge of all the um, excesses of uh, government war making throughout the world. Uh, and uh, Max Blumenthal, instead of being on uh, today at four o'clock, is on tomorrow at two o'clock. Tomorrow, a great day, 11 in the morning. Uh, John uh, Mearsheimer, Professor Mearsheimer, two in the afternoon. Max Blumenthal, four in the afternoon. Aaron Matei. Max and Aaron were just attacked viciously by the Washington Post, they will present as only they can their very unique, very vociferous, very articulate defenses tomorrow. For today, Kyle Anzalone at 3 Eastern. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom. <laughs>